Lenin said that capitalism is horror without end and I think today obviously we can see what this means in terms of the horrors that we see kind of unleashed upon society in terms of wars, terrorism and, uh, and austerity and so forth and obviously there's a, a wave of, uh, of kind of racism and xenophobia and bigotry where it's like capitalism has kind of opened up a, a Pandora's box, if you like, of horrors upon society as it goes into crisis. And this has obviously led to a growing concern amongst a layer of people uh, about uh, the rise of the far right. People look at the, the victories of, uh, of the Brexit campaign uh, or of Trump in the US and, uh, and p certain people draw a kind of relatively superficial conclusion, I would say, that uh, you know, this represents somehow that everyone's a racist now or that, uh, that this is the, the rise of a, of a new fascism and so forth. Um, and, and obviously we saw in Austria the, uh, the, the, the far-right candidate Hoffer coming close uh, to winning with 46%. And there's concerns that Le Pen, uh, the far-right candidate in France, could win in the elections next year there in France. Um, and a lot of the time this has been used to justify actually uh, support on the left for the so-called liberal or progressive section of the capitalists and their candidates. So we see, for example, uh, a, a lot of confused layers on the left in America, for example, saying you have to support Clinton because uh, Trump's a fascist and, uh, and therefore we need to, to somehow get in the, the progressive candidate of Clinton instead of this fascist of Trump. And we have to say, well, look, we share the concern and obviously the disgust towards figures like Trump and the, the kind of bigotry and the racism and so forth. And obviously uh, concern of, of of the potential rise in uh, hate crimes and uh, racist uh, acts that have been seen in the wake of Brexit and so forth. But we also have to remain sober and level-headed in our analysis and, uh, and not draw these kind of superficial conclusions that suddenly everyone's a racist or that Trump is a fascist. Got to have a sense of proportion because for us, you know, these political labels, they have a definite meaning. They're not something to just be bandied about. They have a very definite and scientific meaning. And we are scientific socialists. That's what Marxism aims to be, a scientific analysis of society. And therefore, we have to look at these, uh, these labels in a scientific way and not just throw them around frivol frivolously um, and actually understand what fascism really means in a kind of historical sense, in a materialist sense, in a, in a real social sense. It's not just a, a catch-all label for anyone who's uh, a racist or any party that has certain racist policies. Um, we've got to remember not to confuse the, the part for the whole in the sense that, yes, obviously racism is a part of a fascist ideology, but not everyone who is a racist is a fascist. Um, fascism is much, much more than that. And, uh, and we shouldn't throw these labels around, as I say, frivolously, because it actually acts to disorientate and to confuse uh, and to, to miseducate the movement fundamentally. It acts, if you go around calling everyone uh, every every far right group that that springs into to life, if you could go around calling every one of these the the, the potential rise of fascism, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. You're uh, you're constantly uh, warning about this fascism that's coming about, uh, but it actually disarms and paralyzes potentially the movement at that time uh, when when a real uh, kind of genuine threat to society uh, rises up. And, and it fundamentally, um, it, it misunderstands what is actually behind the rise of these far right and extremist parties and, and leaders that we're seeing. It fundamentally misunderstands what the vote for Trump or Le Pen or, uh, or UKIP or any of this really represents which is that it's, it's not uh, suddenly that everyone's racist or uh, that this is somehow uh, the rise of fascism, but what it represents really is the, uh, the failure of the status quo, the collapse of the, uh, the kind of liberal center ground and also the failure of the, the left and the so-called left leaders. Uh, you saw in, uh, in America, really, you had the potential for a, for a, a strong left candidate to come to, uh, to power in America. If Sanders uh, had, uh, had run, it could have actually beaten and actually taken many of the votes from those who went towards uh, Trump. And, uh, and obviously even the, the bourgeois themselves have admitted 
how uh, Clinton was really the worst possible candidate to put forwards in the sense that she represented everything that people were disgusted by in terms of the establishment and the rich and the elite and the 1% and so forth. Uh, in France, you see how only a few years ago you had Hollande coming in with a, with a kind of tax the rich anti-austerity program as the socialist candidate. But obviously uh, his failure and his capitulation to actually carry out that program has led to the rise of uh, Le Pen. And even in Britain here, we see how UKIP now have just elected in uh, Paul Nuttall as their new leader, whose, whose main vision for UKIP, he says, is actually to become a party of the working class, not to appeal to the kind of uh, backward Shire Tories that, that UKIP has based themselves on in the past, but actually to base themselves on these, uh, these kind of uh, left behind towns and communities that voted for Brexit as a kind of... Uh, rebellion against the elite and the establishment. These are the people that Paul Nuttall and UKIP want to appeal to now. Uh, these Labour voters or these Labour heartlands that have been left behind. And obviously there are kind of genuine fascist layers within, uh, within these movements. But again, we have to have a sense of proportion. These are quite small and relatively insignificant. Like uh, in, the, in the UK, you've seen the English Defence League. But the reality is, yes, they have a, a fascist ideology to them, but they're not a mass movement by any means. They're, they're, they're normally having to bus in people from across the country. And even then, when, the, the, when they arrive in these towns, they're obviously met with much greater force from the labor movement in the, and the local uh, communities. Uh, and similarly in the US, where you've had the, uh, the so-called alt-right, not a particularly scientific term itself, very kind of heterogeneous movement. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a very small one as well. You see uh, these videos of this alt-right uh, conference that was, ha that ha that, that was uh, taking place in America a few weeks ago where uh, where the, the the main speaker was uh, was kind of alluding to lots of kind of fascist rhetoric and so forth but uh, but the actual audience was was tiny just a couple of hundred not even thousands or the hundreds of thousands that it's made out to be but just a couple of hundred people and even within that uh, you see in the video there's a, there's quite a lot looking uncomfortable as the, those around them start uh, throwing up uh, Nazi salutes and so forth. And so we've got to have a sense of proportion about the, 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 the real kind of fascist layer that is there and, uh, and see in fact what is the real reason behind the, the rise of uh, these kind of far right uh, and, and so called populist uh, movements. Um, and go back, I think, to look at what uh, Leon Trotsky uh, wrote on the question of fascism in the 30s when you had genuine fascist movements arising. And, uh, and what you see is that Trotsky uh, outlined uh, above all that, that in, went from, you know, when he was analysing in, uh, in Italy or Spain or Germany the rise of fascism, what he explained above all is that fascism is a genuine mass movement. It's, uh, it's, it's made up not just of, uh, of, of kind of the, the strong men fascist leaders like Hitler and Mussolini, but, but actually that it has a mass base to it. And, uh, and it, that mass base exists in what he called the, the frenzied petty bourgeoisie um, and lumpen elements. Basically, uh, layers of society, the kind of middling layers of society, like uh, the, the ruined shopkeepers and the peasantry and, uh, and the professionals, the white collar workers who'd been ruined by, uh, by the crisis and very quickly gone from being kind of a privileged layer in society or uh, a reasonable uh, income layer in society to suddenly thrown onto the scrap heap. And they combined with uh, the kind of lumpenized elements, the layer that's always been kind of thrown onto the scrap heap by capitalism, these declassed elements uh, that exist in society uh, as a result of capitalism's kind of permanent inability to provide jobs <coughs> and so forth. These elements were, were grouped together and, uh, and actually given uh, life, given, a, given a, a kind of a sense of purpose, uh, was, was what Trotsky analysed. This is, uh, this, you had a genuine mass movement of these layers. Because there's always been, if you like, under capitalism, there's always been gangs and thugs who've uh, been kind of grouped together and uh, empowered by, uh, by the ruling class to, to terrorise the labour movement, to terrorise working class communities. You saw uh, in the 1905 Russian Revolution, for example, pogroms organised by, uh, by, uh, by the ruling class 
uh, known as the, uh, and, and, and these groups uh, of thugs known as the Black Hundreds that went around terrorizing communities. And even today, as I say, you have groups like the EDL and Britain First and so forth that, uh, that go around trying to terrorize uh, working class communities and ethnic communities. And, uh, and obviously we've also seen how the ruling class will use often throughout history uh, kind of paramilitary groups, uh, in, particularly in uh, the ex-colonial countries. In Colombia, for example, you have uh, paramilitary gangs used to attack trade unions, to att attack the labor movement, and, uh, and carry out these kind of extrajudicial killings of uh, trade union leaders. In Indonesia, you had uh, these sort of gangs used in, in 1965, 66 to conduct anti-communist purges uh, by the uh, by uh, in 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 in, um, uh, in alliance with the, uh, the 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 Suharto government or uh, or dictatorship really, and uh, and even in the end, at the end of the First World War in Germany, you had the beginnings of Nazism around uh, the Freikorps, who are these kind of paramilitary gangs of war veterans used to uh, attack the labor movement and the, the socialists there. But the difference with fascism is that it actually was a mass movement that didn't just rely on, uh, on these kind of uh, gangs, but actually, as I say, took together the, the destitute and the ruined middle classes and organize them and use them really as a battering ram against uh, the working class and against the uh, the labor movement. Um, now, the bourgeois have always, if you like, had to lean on uh, on that kind of petty bourgeois layer throughout society, lean on, lean on the masses, because obviously the bourgeois themselves, the 1%, if you like, are obviously a, a tiny proportion of society. They can't carry out their program simply uh, with the numbers that they have uh, themselves as a class. And so they've always had to lean on the, on the masses and, and particularly the middle classes. Um, in, the, uh, in the French revolutions, the, the, when you had a progressive bourgeoisie, if you like, that was, that was actually carrying out a progressive program to, uh, to abolish feudalism and, uh, and abolish all these kind of fetters in society, the, the bourgeois, the rising bourgeois at that time, lent on the, the masses to carry out this progressive program of, of the abolition of the monarchy and the, and the feudal uh, order. And they appealed to that layer, obviously, with, a, with, uh, with demands for, you know, liberty, uh, fraternity and uh, e equality. Um, but, and in the, the heyday of capitalism that followed in the 19th century, the, uh, the, the, the ruling class leans again on the, on the middle class to carry out uh, kind of reforms and uh, this is like the high point if you like of liberal capitalism when when uh, when liberalism and reformism were, were able to actually uh, expand the middle class and offer certain uh, rights and reforms to uh, to this layer but what we see in the uh, in, in the in the beginning of the death agony of capitalism and the decline of capitalism is that now this uh, the, the the ruling class becomes senile and decrepit, and uh, and cannot allow, can, and capitalism as it goes into crisis can no longer afford these kind of reforms. You have a polarization taking place in society, a collapse of this liberal uh, center ground, and even the the kind of democratic rights that have been won and struggled for by the ruling class uh, are, are kind of unaffordable from the point of view of the the capitalists. The the freedom of the press, the freedom to organize and to vote and instead what capitalism requires in this period you see is an actual uh, smashing of these rights a smashing of the organized uh, working class of, of the of the working class and its its organizations uh, basically capitalism is you know requires these uh, organizations to be uh, to be to be shattered in order to push conditions and wages even below kind of uh, subsistence levels and it uses the this petty bourgeois mass this uh, this middle class ruined layer in society as a as basically a hammer to do this smashing of against the working class in its organization to 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 terrorize and to atomize uh, the working class and this really we have to emphasize was and still is uh, kind of the primary role of fascism historically was uh, is a desperate attempt really by the ruling class to survive and um and and the the point was that that, that trotsky pointed out that this fascist movement always and everywhere only ever came to power on the back of the failure of a revolutionary movement to offer a way out. In, for example, in Italy, where you had uh, Mussolini, uh, he only came to power on the back of uh, a failure of the working class to take power uh, 
in, uh, in, in, in the, the factory occupations of uh, 1920, when you had across Italy mass movement of the working class that, that occupied the factories um, and, uh, and could have taken power, Trotsky pointed out. The only thing stopping them was the, the vacillation and the cowardice of the reformist leaders who were at the head of this movement. In the, uh, in the Socialist Party. Uh, and similarly in Germany, you only see Hitler coming to power not after one attempt, but many attempts of the working class to take power in 1918, in 1923. And in fact, even, uh, even in the late 20s and early 30s, Trotsky points out, the working class was still enormously strong. It's the, the organizations of the working class in the Socialist Party and the Communist Party together between them. They had millions of uh, supporters and, 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 and hundreds of thousands of members uh, with, with a huge influence. And together, if they'd been united, uh, they could have actually uh, easily uh, broken uh, the, the, the Nazi movement and, uh, and kept them at bay. Uh, but the problem was, Trotsky pointed out, that they were, uh, they were completely unable and unwilling to do this for, for, for two reasons. One, the socialists, were, the socialist leaders in particular, placed their faith in the so-called lesser evil of the, uh, of the, the capitalists and, uh, and the bourgeoisie. They, 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 you know, they, they were rather having uh, Brunning than, uh, than, than and voting, you know, advocating a vote for the, for the so-called lesser evil, basically. Than, uh, than, than, than actually organize a movement against uh, the fascists and, and Hitler. Um, and, uh, um, and then on the other side, you had the ultra-leftism of the communist leaders, of the Stalinists, who, uh, who basically were in what, what, what was called the third period of Stalinism, where it was incredibly ultra-left, very sectarian, and they went around saying the real biggest danger was not the, uh, not the actual fascists, but what they called the social fascists. They said the social democracy were, were, were the real evil that had to be smashed, and, uh, and first Hitler would come to power, and then it would be the task of the, uh, of the communists. Trotsky pointed out if, if, if you'd had an actual united front between these organizations, um, then they actually together could have uh, could have halted the the fascist movement in its uh, in its march, and uh, and instead what you had was because of the the ultra leftism of the Stalinists and the and the the, the capitulations uh, and the reformism of uh, of the Social Democrats. The result was, as in Hitler's own word, he came to power without so much as uh, breaking a, a pane of glass. Um, and, uh, and it was really this, Trotsky pointed out, this failure of, of, of a revolutionary leadership to offer a way out, uh, or of, a failure of, of the absence of a revolutionary leadership full stop, that meant that the, that the petty bourgeois layers would, uh, would, having seen that kind of failure of the revolution, would swing behind uh, the fascists, looking for, for some sort of order and uh, an end to the, the, the kind of chaos and the, the, the instability in society. Trotsky pointed out that the petty bourgeois is, is as, as Marxists have always said, this middle layer is not a, uh, an independent class in society in the sense that uh, it sits between the working class and the capitalists. Uh, they're neither uh, outright capitalists who are able to you know, um, exploit uh, a working class for themselves, but neither are they part of the working class that has to sell its uh, labor power uh, in, in exchange for wages. Um, and therefore, this class has a, has a very independent uh, kind of, it, has, it doesn't have a rather an independent class interest. It's, uh, it's, um, it can swing between the interests of the two major classes in society, the working class and the capitalists. And, uh, and by its very nature as, as, a, as a class, it's very scattered and very isolated and, uh, and very individualistic. Um, not involved in, in common production in the factories, in the offices, in the workplace, doesn't have its own uh, organizations in terms of the, the trade unions and the political parties, and, um, and, and therefore doesn't have the same kind of class consciousness as, a, as a, that the working class has, its same uh, common interests. Uh, and the same organizations like the working class has formed throughout history. And instead, you see, as I say, it vacillates between the two. And uh, on the one hand, uh, it's, it's not part of the working class, but on the other hand, is crushed by the real kind of capitalist, by monopoly capitalism, that obviously smashes uh, and crushes um, small businesses and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and what Trotsky pointed out is that if given a revolutionary lead, 
then the, uh, the, the middling layers, the petty bourgeois, could swing behind revolution and, uh, and, and behind the working class and could be won over to revolution. And indeed, you saw that in the Russian Revolution, the fact that the, the Bolsheviks came to power because they were able to win over this layer by putting, uh, you know, by having a movement led by the working class that also answered the questions that the peasantry and the, and the soldiers, for example, had. They could. Uh, they actually won over these layers and were able to uh, to win them over to the idea of revolution. But in the absence of this, in the absence of a revolutionary lead, then uh, this layer would swing behind reaction. As I say, demanding an end to the uh, the kind of chaos and instability that we see uh, in these periods. Um, and and that's really uh, what you saw in Germany above all else, where uh, this, there was this petty bourgeois layer was completely ruined by, uh, by the crisis of, in the Weimar Republic, by the hyperinflation that was taking place uh, throughout the 20s. And, uh, and as I say, it went from being a very relatively privileged white collar layer to, to being a kind of part of this mass unemployment. And the, the fascists appealed to this layer by, uh, by actually promising to fight against the kind of crushing domination of monopoly capitalism. Hence why, uh, you know, the, the, as a movement, it was called National Socialism. It was aiming to provide stability and, uh, and some sort of justice to this layer. And Trotsky uh, said how this layer, this, uh, in this layer, basically, the, the fascists, they, they, they untied the arms of the scattered masses, he said, and, uh, and organized the movement out of human dust, giving them the illusion of being an independent force. So this is what fascism promised to this layer. But the reality was, was far different. As a, as a movement, fascism was actually backed by the very big business and finance capital that it claimed uh, to be uh, to be uh, opposing uh, and was really a last desperate attempt by the ruling class in the face of the threat of Bolshevism and revolution. It was really a last throw of the dice and uh, and one that was not done without reluctance from the ruling class. They, uh, they're not willing to, to hand over power to these uh, kind of uh, upstarts that, 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 that fascism uh, creates. It's not, uh, they're not willing to hand over power to these people lightly. Much prefer to have a kind of reliable member of the ruling class from the aristocracy, from the military, uh, to lead uh, these kind of movements. But what you see with fascism that actually it's these uh, so-called self-made men like Hitler, like Mussolini, who aren't kind of traditionally part of the, the kind of the establishment and so forth, aren't part, aren't part of the, uh, the aristocracy and so forth. These, uh, these are the layers that, that fascism has at its head. And, uh, and the ruling class is unwilling to, to really hand over power to these unreliable leaders, but nevertheless does so as a last throw of the dice. And, that, and in this respect, uh, something like uh, the Pinochet uh, coup in Chile is, 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 is different, where Pinochet was part of the army, he was part of these generals and, uh, and these reliable parts of the establishment, and, uh, and, and there wasn't such a mass movement kind of at the, uh, you know, around Pinochet. It was much more based on the institutions and the armed forces of the, uh, of the state. And, uh, and, and the difference with, uh, with fascism is it goes far beyond just uh, the, the, the rule of the state, the, this kind of Bonapartist uh, use of uh, the military and the police, but actually goes much further, takes over the whole of society, the universities, the media, all of these uh, kind of institutions become uh, accumulated in the hands of, uh, of the fascist state and, uh, and, and really takes over the whole of society in this respect. Um, and, uh, but what you see is that once fascism has come into power, um, it actually dispenses with that mass base that's kind of got it there in the, in the first place and, uh, and becomes really an extreme form of, uh, of Bonapartism, an unstable regime that's, uh, that's resting on repression and, uh, and on the, the, the police state. Uh, and it rids itself then of the, uh, the genuine ideologues of the movement as well. You see how in, uh, in Germany, for example, you had the brown shirts, the SA, around Hitler, who were 
genuine believers in the, in the ideology of fascism in the sense of they genuinely believed in the in the cause of national socialism that there could be uh, this struggle against uh, the monopoly capitalists but uh, but Hitler actually dispensed with this layer once in power in uh, in what was famously called the night of the long knives in 1934 where uh, where this layer the of the the brown shirt leaders were basically liquidated and uh, and it became after that fascism much more uh, um, uh, a, a force much more concentrated through the state apparatus and uh, and the SS instead uh, Hitler's kind of personal bodyguard and um, and similarly in Spain you see the move away from the uh, the phalangists who are the kind of original real fascist ideologues in uh, around Franco uh, you, you see a move after 1939 when when Franco comes to power away from these people and much more towards technocrats and the, the kind of Catholics of the, the Opus Dei sects and so forth, much more based on these layers and uh, dispenses with the, with the genuine believers in fascism, if you like, and becomes uh, a, a more of a, a Bonapartist regime, uh, this, as I say, an inherently unstable regime, uh, and one that is really out of control of the ruling class itself. Um, and, and you see for that reason why, for example, in Germany, you see attempts to actually remove Hitler, who he's, he, he's, he represented, as I say, this, this uh, desperate attempt by the ruling class to keep away Bolshevism and communism. Uh, but in the process, they lost control of the situation and, uh, and tried to regain it, actually, through uh, even a, a attempted assassinations against uh, Hitler in the, in the so-called Operation Valkyrie, 1944. Um, and, uh, and these kind of episodes show why really I think the ruling class would be unwilling to go down the path of fascism again today because uh, they've had their fingers burnt by these bad experiences. Um, they, as I say, they much prefer a kind of reliable member of the ruling class and, uh, and, and the use of Bonapartism or, or kind of military rule um, when, they, when, when they can no longer use democracy, of course, that is. Um, but, uh, but they can also see today the, uh, the the kind of uh, the dangerous response that actually fascists elicit in uh, amongst the masses amongst the working class for example in Greece you had uh, the the rise of the golden dawn a genuine fascist movement that did go around terrorizing uh, the the labor movement terrorizing demonstrations and uh, and ethnic communities and so forth um, but uh, what you saw was actually the, when, when they did carry out uh, killings against left-wing activists, um, the, uh, it actually uh, it, it created a, an enormous response from the labor movement, from the masses. You had huge demonstrations coming out against uh, the Golden Dawn, and, uh, and ones that were very radical. In, in other words, these, the, 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 these kind of fascist uh, groups were actually causing a, a mass movement that was, that was dangerous from the point of view of the ruling class. And for that reason, the, uh, the government, the, not the Syriza government, but the, the, the New Democracy one before that, ended up actually locking away the, uh, the leaders of the Golden Dawn and putting them, uh, putting them in jail because uh, basically these were kind of rabid dogs who they, the, they were out of control and they didn't want to, uh, to, to give these uh, people uh, too, much, uh, too much of a leash, if you like, uh, too much of a, a long leash. And, uh, and, and so I think for these reasons, you know, at, at the moment at the least, the fascists uh, are, kept, uh, are kept at bay by the ruling class. And uh, it's not to say that in the future they won't be used as some sort of auxiliary in a reactionary movement. But at the moment, the, 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 the ruling class are unwilling to go down that path for, for fear, obviously, that these, uh, they can actually invoke a, a much bigger response from the left and from the working class against, uh, against these kind of fascist groups. Um, but really, I'd say the main reason why fascism is not on the cars today in the sense of a genuine mass movement of the, the nature of the type that we've seen in, uh, in Germany or Italy and Spain in the, the 1920s and 30s. The reason why it's fundamentally different today is there's been a fundamental change in the balance of class forces in society. Nowadays, you see that the middle class, which is again being uh, kind of crushed by capitalism, by the crisis. But now you see the middle class actually being drawn much more closely towards the working class. You see it being proletarianized, if you like. And, uh, and these layers, 
that, that, that used to be a kind of white collar privileged layers in society, now you're actually seeing them much more joining the ranks of the labor movement and forming trade unions and uh, going on strike. And hence why in, in, even in Britain, for example, you have teachers, lecturers, and even obviously junior doctors and lawyers and so forth, actually now coming to, as joining the labor movement, taking strike action, and being much closer to the rest of the working class in this respect, and in many respects being part of the working class, being proletarianized by this crisis. As I say, it's not to uh, deny the idea that small fascist groups like the EDL still exist, and where they do uh, kind of organize and, and come out onto the streets, they have to be met with uh, with the force of the organized working class you know we can't rely on uh, on tory politicians or the police and the uh, the bourgeois courts and the law to uh, the, the, i.e. The, the bourgeois state cannot be relied upon to to stop uh, the, the these kind of fascist gangs um, and obviously you actually see a lot of the time it's the police who are kind of protecting these uh, groups and allowing them to march through uh, town um, but uh, we have to um, uh, actually meet them on the streets in the way that, uh, for example, Mosley and his gang of, uh, of fascists in Britain were met uh, down the road from here in, uh, in Cable Street uh, in uh, 1936 by the organized working class, by uh, a united front of the, of the, of the local community, uh, alongside the trade unions, the Communist Party, the Labour Party, all of these came out in force to basically stop Molesley and the fascists uh, marching through the East End and terrorizing uh, the communities there. And, uh, and as I say, uh, in Germany in 1929 to 33, Trotsky emphasized that again, a united front of the socialists and the, the communists could have easily uh, defeated the fascists and, and smashed the, uh, the Nazis. But, uh, but because of the, the betrayals on both sides, uh, particularly the, uh, the ultra-leftism of the Stalinists, you had uh, fascism coming to power um, without any uh, resistance at all. Um, today, as I say, the, the immediate threat is not of, uh, of fascism or even really of uh, Bonapartism in the sense of uh, a kind of military uh, reaction. Um, all of these are being held back mainly by the, the, the strength of the working class and the radicalization now exists that exists amongst uh, workers and youth. And really what we would say is that the biggest problem today um, is, uh, is the missing subjective factor, as Trotsky called it in, uh, in his uh, program of the, uh, the Fourth International. Um, he said, it's, he said in, in this, uh, the, the transitional program, as it's known, he said it's really the crisis of humanity can be reduced in the ultimate analysis to a crisis of leadership and that the conditions for revolution were there the objective conditions in terms of the technology and the wealth in society, but also in terms of consciousness, he said. Consciousness was not only ripe, but the, the conditions have become ripe rotten in the sense that because of the failure of a revolutionary leadership to actually take advantage of these conditions and, and, and offer a revolutionary uh, way out, uh, consciousness had gone gone past that and, uh, and, and people had uh, kind of lost faith in the idea of revolution and, and you'd seen the rise then of, of these rotten uh, symptoms within society of, of uh, fascism and, uh, and so forth. And, and the same situation is, is taking place today where the conditions are, are clearly ripe in the, in, in the sense of uh, radicalization is taking place. But what's lacking is, the, is again this subjective factor of leadership. And for that reason, you see these swings, quite violent swings, in public opinion to the right and to the left. And, uh, and we must not lose sight of that fact that this isn't a one-way uh, process. It's that's, that's not like it's uh, solely a swing to the, the far right that's taking place in society. There's a, a polarization and there's a, a corresponding move to the left as well. We've seen, obviously, the rise of, uh, of Syriza in Greece much more prominent than the, the rise of Golden Dawn. Uh, we've seen the, the rise of Podemos in Spain, of Sanders in, uh, in the US reclaiming the, the word socialism, putting it back on the agenda. And similarly, obviously, Corbyn here in Britain. We've got to, got to look at those developments and not just uh, beat the drums about the, the, the threat of fascism.
and highlight really that what's missing, what is uh, lacking in this whole situation, is a revolutionary leadership with a bold socialist program. We need, as, uh, as Trotsky said, a sword and a shield in the sense that you need a, the, the shield of the organized working class, the labor movement, coming out and meeting uh, these groups where they do come out onto the streets, meeting them uh, with, uh, with force, with, uh, you know, blocking the, the path of these people to march through the streets. But on the other hand, also a sword, an actual program that offers a solution to the, to the, to the, to the causes of racism and causes of bigotry in the first place. Provide uh, an actual answer to the questions of job and housing and, uh, and healthcare and so forth. Because the reality is that the so-called lesser evil of the, uh, the liberal establishment figures or the, uh, the so-called lefts, these, uh, these people don't offer a solution to these uh, problems. They don't offer a way out and, to, and uh, an answer to the actual problems faced by the working class in terms of jobs and housing and so forth. And, uh, and unless, therefore, you remove that kind of fertile ground upon which uh, racism and so forth and xenophobia thrive, unless you uh, remove that fertile ground, and, uh, and offer something to the to the Rust Belt, uh, you know, states in uh, in the U.S. or the uh, the kind of left behind, scarred communities in Britain. Uh, unless you solve the problems facing uh, facing these uh, these parts of the country, uh, these parts of uh, of society, these parts of the working class, unless you solve that fundamentally, you'll always have uh, racism and xenophobia and so forth rearing their ugly head. In other words, the only real solution to, uh, to, to the kind of rise of the far right that we see today is to put an end to the kind of rotten capitalist system and the failed status quo that have, uh, that have led to, the, uh, led to the, the, the rise today. And, uh, and in that respect, we need, above all, uh, to, to end, as I say, end the capitalist system and have a revolution in Britain and internationally. I'll leave it there.